welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining in so enthusiastically. It used to be the case that when we woke up in the morning, we would look outside and we would see the dew and we would listen to birds, but now of course we don't do any of that. What do we do? We turn to our smartphones and we look at the headlines. And when it's late at night and we're ready to go back into sleep, uh, we do exactly the same thing. Um, the news bookends our lives, and if you look at the traffic on the BBC News website, some 15 million people will check that site over four times a day uh, during the day. Now, what are we looking for? What is the search? What kind of information are we looking for? What do we think it's going to change? It's so unclear. The news is something that seeps up on us as we're growing up, and very rarely does anyone take us to one side and try to explain why it's there, how it's put together. People will have a shot at introducing us to paintings. People will have a shot at telling us about theater and literature. But no one really ever stops to systematically warn us about what might happen when we come across this sort of material. Um, it's deeply puzzling. It's full of mystery and power. We're not quite the same people after we've looked at this stuff. People think that they can relax on a Sunday by reading the newspaper. It's a striking idea of what might uh, happen. Um, there's, you know, we're nowadays um, surrounded uh, uh, by news. Uh, the philosopher Hegel said that a society becomes modern when it swaps this for this. Um, essentially, when it stops going to church on a Sunday and starts reading the newspaper instead. We are firmly in that age. And yet, though we know about uh, religion and what it might do to us, and we're prepared to argue quite vociferously for it or against it, when it comes to news, we're curiously cowed and timid and passive consumers of this information. In the 18th century, when uh, people were looking forward to an age of more freely available information. This was the great rallying cry of social reformers in the 18th century. When reformers looked forward to a future with more information, they imagined that more information would be an unambiguous good, that by knowing more, we would care more, we would want to do more good, and the light of reason would shine in previously dark places. It hasn't quite happened that way. There's a curious way in which, even though we have unbelievable amounts of information, the utility of that information, both for the individual and for the running of the state, is um, at best questionable. Um, you know, there are two ways, maybe, to keep a population passive, resigned, despairing, accepting of whatever status quo is uh, given to them. The first way to keep the population down, I think, is the way that's been tried in North Korea. Stop all news. That's one way. But there's another, more insidious, cleverer way. Flood the people with news. Give them so much news, they can't remember what was going on yesterday, let alone in this morning. I mean, who can remember here what was happening in the news yes, uh, last week? This time last week. Who knows? I mean, it's a prehistory. No one can remember. Uh, prizes for anyone who can afterwards. But basically, we're deeply um, uh, puzzled by the torrent of information and unable to quite make sense of this. Um, I'm very interested in the therapeutic. I look for the therapeutic um, qualities that might be available within all sorts of art forms and genres. I've looked at philosophy. I've looked at literature. I've looked at the world of fine art. Um, and now I've turned my attention to news. And the thing that I'm arguing for is a more therapeutic kind of news. In other words, a news that might be more geared towards our uh, inner and also societal needs. How could, a news, how could the news get better in the sense of being more focused on the genuine requirements of its audiences rather than the passing titillation of its audiences or um, the, the fear and panic side of the, of the audience? How could news become genuinely useful rather than merely, as it is now, gripping, compelling, um, but not necessarily nutritious in many ways. We certainly know news is important. How can we get it better? Um, let me begin by taking you on a tour through some of the issues that I think we're facing as the consumers of news. Um, in every case, trying to get things to go a little 
better. Now look, one of the great puzzles of the modern age is that there are many serious issues that surround us. Um, this is one of the most uh, serious uh, uh, global warming, climate change. Um, the problem is, um, you will find that if you are running a news organization and you put this on your front page, or on your home page, um, your viewership will drop catastrophically. However, you will also find that if you put this on the front page, um, your viewership will increase exponentially. There used to be a distinction between important news um, uh, that would go at the front and then unimportant but perhaps fun news that would go at the back. That hierarchy, the architecture of news, has broken down. And this is a serious problem for anyone trying to get serious ideas across to uh, uh, the audience. Um, the important and the popular should be one. It's very important that important things are popular. Right? Uh, too often, there's an idea that if you're dealing with important stuff, it doesn't really matter how many, um, uh, what kind of an audience you get, because it's so important. But the problem is, in a democracy, uh, politicians need uh, the population to have their attention focused on the really important issues and to care about them through time. Um, this is breaking down. And so the popularity of Taylor Swift's legs over uh, Ar the Arctic melt is not just a, a passing journalistic problem. It's a problem for our democracies. It's a problem for our, our societies. A very serious problem is going on. Now, what do we do about this? I'm an optimistic sort of person. And part of the reason I'm optimistic is because I look at the example of the Catholic Church. In the Renaissance, the Catholic Church were very interested in getting people to focus on the truths of the Gospels. I don't necessarily believe in the truths of the Gospels, but that's what they wanted to do. And let's look at what they did. They put up advertisements everywhere, um, also known as altarpieces. And um, these advertisements were designed to make the important popular. Now, the Catholic Church knew that if you're, you've got some important things to say, don't rely on this fellow. Don't rely on guys with beards and big books, because no one uh, uh, thinks about them. What you need to do is to go and search for the Taylor Swift of the day, and therefore, you go here, and you go here, and Bellini was on the case, and they did it very, very well. Uh, we need to take a leaf from their book, Popularization, which is what this is about. This is a giant work of popularization, is a very important skill, and one that serious journalists and serious media people today neglect at their peril. Uh, it's an absolutely fundamental part of communication in a democracy that is very distracted. So this is something we're going to have to get better at if we're to keep the important topics at the front of our minds. But let's think of Bellini, and let's try and tie those legs to the Arctic melt. You know what I'm saying. Now, um, I've, I mentioned that there's uh, a little bit too much news. The good news is there isn't so much news. It's just that news organizations constantly tell us that there is a plethora of information. They, they keep presenting things which are actually not new at all as though they're brand new. But actually, what we need to do as consumers of the news is to become more alive to the fact that there are archetypes out there. There are stories that keep coming round and round and round. And they look different and they can be polished up to look completely new. And the news loves to do that because it gets more money from doing that. But what we need to do as consumers is to go the other way and try and reduce the number of stories to get a handle on the archetypes. In the book I've written uh, with this talk, I identify 32 main archetypal stories that just keep coming round and round and round. There's very little that is ever new. It's archetypal, but the news dissuades us from thinking that way because it wants to make things completely fresh because that's how it's going to make the money. So we need to get sharper at doing that, and um, uh, I want to help you to do that. Um, look, there's one story that keeps coming around. It looks very different. This is one part of the story. Uh, this is another part of the story, and this is another part of the story. It's the same story, but it looks like many stories. It's not. And basically what that story is about is someone extraordinary, the king, or the son of God, or a, a, a singer um, with, with a big audience, um, doing something quite ordinary, um, uh, putting, wrestling with a car seat, uh, or buying lettuce at Whole Foods, uh, or giving birth in a stable. Um, so it's the same story. It just, it just keeps coming round. We need to train ourselves and give ourselves the tools to spot the archetypes. There's a lot less news than we think. Maneuver number one. Okay, other maneuvers. There's something else that's really problematic about the news nowadays, which is that we can hear things like, today in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 300 people died. And afterwards, we can go make a cup of tea and not give it another thought. Or we go straight to sleep 
You know, disaster news seems to be a perfect thing. You can, you can listen to the news of 300 people and then go to be asleep within five minutes. It's an extraordinary, unbelievable ability. Are we crazy? Are we the nastiest people, species that could ever have been invented? How come we don't care? How come, despite all the fiber optic cables and satellites and foreign journalists risking their lives in places, how come what gets called world news, which is uh, primarily disaster-based, gets one of the lowest audience figures of any kind of news imaginable? Um, it's to do with empathy. Right? The news is so focused on getting us information, hard data, 300 people have died, um, that it forgets a very important thing trying to make us care about it. And the very important thing about caring, you cannot care about 300 people dying if you never knew they existed. If their existence was entirely unsuspected and entirely uninteresting and abstract, their deaths will seem equally uninteresting and abstract. The news doesn't recognize this, uh, doesn't recognize this phenomenon, and therefore it parachutes us into areas of disaster at the last moment. Um, we need to know about the steady state of a place before its catastrophes can come in any way to matter to us. Some people will say, well, look, we're racists, and that's obviously why we don't care about the Democratic Republic of Congo. These people have got different skin color, so therefore you know, I, we don't care. That's nonsense. Of course, we could care. You know, we'll sit in a performance of King Lear and weep about a guy who never even existed hundreds of hundreds of years ago. So we have immensely rich powers of empathy, but they need to be stirred into action. And the way they're stirred into action is by a discipline which, for want of a better word, we could call art. Art is the name of the discipline designed to get big and important ideas more powerfully, more imaginatively into our heads. In the realm of news, the art form uh, that is predominant is photojournalism. The problem with, with photojournalism is there's ever less of it um, that news organizations will pay for uh, reliably. If you talk to any, many depressed people out there, philosophers, top, top of the league, but right below them are photojournalists. No one loves them um, because um, they, they do their work. You know, people at Magnum, you know, in despair, the, the great material is not recognized. It's very, very important to have good pictures, right? That helps a story to get across. What is a good picture? I'm not talking about color balance or, you know, cropping, etc. That's not really what it comes down to. A good picture is a bearer of new information. It doesn't really corroborate something that you already knew. It advances the state of knowledge. Take child marriage. Um, we've all heard about child marriage and lots of things, you know, we might have read about it. This is a photo by, uh, this is, incidentally, Democratic Republic of Congo, a photo that's probably not going to help us to care. This is something that might help us to care. Stephanie Sinclair, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, did a wonderful uh, photo essay on uh, uh, child marriage in Yemen. One learns all sorts of things from, you know, this picture. First of all, you realize that it's not little girls getting married, it's little old ladies. Um, uh, these uh, children have had something so traumatic happen to them that um, they have aged overnight, seemingly, um, and they have a, a, a kind of poignant, pathetic uh, uh, sadness in their eyes. And meanwhile, the men are not, you know, um, the powerful brutes one imagines. They're like lost children themselves. So it's a lot more complicated. There's a lot of information. One can stare at this picture for a long time and develop some of the deeper feelings that a bad picture, whatever the cropping and color balance is all about, is going to deny us. So we need good quality images. And more than that, we need good quality art to get us to care about data. We can't simply care about data, however it's landed, uh, 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 given to us on, on, it, on, on our plates. We need it to be properly cooked, presented, um, uh, seduced, we need to be seduced into caring. Um, this happens not just in uh, areas of the developing world. Um, you know, this is President Obama. Um, this is a dead picture. We don't, we don't learn anything about the, the man. We, like, we've seen this 100 times, we don't pay any attention. This picture is alive because <laughs> it's telling us something new. Now, we know that Obama is a fake and can fake things to get elected. Did we know that Obama can sometimes fake things in order to please the child of a White House staffer who is playing Spider-Man? Um, not necessarily. This is new information, important information we are learning. This is photojournalism in action. We need more of it. Point number two. Moving on. Uh, many of us here are very nice. In fact, everybody is really nice, okay? And generally, we trust our fellow citizens to be nice. You go up to a stranger, you know, people are friendly, right? Until you go on a news website and you go what's called below the line and you realize a really dark truth. Everybody is insane. They are completely <laughs> crazy. They are vicious and dark and cruel and unforgiving and just angry all the time about everything. What is going on? You know, this is, uh, these are some, this is a, an average, I pull this up, it's an average article about George Osborne in The Guardian. I mean, it's unbelievable. Someone wants to sit on him and, and punch him. Someone wants to take off his socks and put him in his mouth. I mean, it's just insane. What is going on? Now look, 
I think we need to be prepared for this. I think it's a little bit like journals. You know how a journal is. In certain moods, um, you know, things are going, not, not going very well. You, you know, you go up to your bedroom and you pull out your journal and you pour out your woes. And you go, I'm going to kill myself. I hate everybody. No one understands me. It's all awful. And you have a good cry and the tears mingle with the ink. And then you shut the journal. I'm just being autobiographical. You put the journal away. Um, <laughs> And, and then you rejoin uh, group life, and you know, hopefully no one will ever read this, because if they did, um, they would have a very distorted picture of you. It's one moment, it's a snapshot, but let's not dwell on it. Um, but uh, if we get arrested with that image, we may never be able to be seen in the same light again. And therefore, it's very important that we don't read people's journals, and it's equally important that we must never read below the line, um, <laughs> because it's not really true. We need to be able to love each other and uh, trust one another and go out into the world and do business and, 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 and communicate with one another. We can't do that if we take the message of the comments seriously. Uh, it's a very, there's a very particular pathology going on. Um, we need to be aware of it and resist it. A lot of it is driven by hope. The news gives us hope that the world can be better than it is and that it isn't and it produces enormous amounts of rage. It doesn't help us, the news doesn't help us with our hopes. It also doesn't, of course, help us with our fear. Um, the news is always trying to scare us about all sorts of things. So we need help with our fear and our hope. Now, this is another kind of story that um, is very, very popular. This is one of the most popular stories that ran in the Daily Mail two years ago. Um, a huge number of hits on this story. Um, this is a man, a father, and this is his very sweet son. Shortly after this picture was taken, the father took the son and his sister into a lay-by and killed them, and then killed himself. And um, they ended up in this Saab. They were found uh, by somebody walking their dog, uh, dead. And this was an incredibly popular story. What on earth is going on? Are we crazy? Are we, as a species, demented that we love to read about stuff which is obviously so sad and um, really should be the realm of private grief? What's going on? Let's call on Aristotle for a little bit of help here. Aristotle recognized that there is an appetite, a human appetite, for very, very dark stories um, involving people uh, who make some error, are prey to some passing passion, fury, darkness, and do something utterly catastrophic and ruin themselves and those around them. And the name that Aristotle gave to this phenomenon was, of course, tragedy. And very importantly, Aristotle believed that witnessing tragedy was not merely a gory spectacle, was not merely some kind of uh, tittle-tattle or uh, rubbernecking. It belonged to part of a civilizing process. The greatest horrors have a role to play in building up civilization. And that's why the ancient Greeks believed in taking the whole population regularly and showing them this sort of stuff. Oedipus the king, which beats anything in the Daily Mail in terms of, uh, um, I was wondering, you know, how would you headline uh, this kind of story? Sex with mum was blinding. Uh, that's the Daily Mail. But um, in other words, Aristotle believed that the, uh, uh, the disasters and misfortunes of others are important to us. Why are they important? They teach us fear and pity. Pity for the person who has ended up in a disastrous, catastrophic situation. And the lesson is we are all of us, however much it seems like everything's fine with us and we're completely in command and rational, all of us are quite near the edge of disaster all the time. Therefore, we need to be scared for ourselves and pitiful, uh, full of pity for the person who has been pushed over the edge or, the, the, uh, or has, has pushed themselves over the edge. The news is so scared about um, compassion for those who've done very bad things. It's scared that we'll want to open the prison doors, um, that it doesn't take us to that Aristotelian, tragic, cathartic emotion. So it brings us the raw material, doesn't take us to the edge. It merely leaves us perturbed, gripped, knowing that there's something we're searching for, and yet unable to offer us, generally, redemption. It's because this is considered as low news, and serious people in serious journalism think that this sort of stuff is ridiculous. It's clearly very important to us psychologically, and I believe we need to find a way to use this material, and Sophocles and Aristotle are one beginning of an answer. There's something else that we absolutely adore doing uh, when we look at the news, is taking care of some car crashes. Um, love a good car crash, particularly when there are lots and lots of people dead, maybe in some fog. Uh, we, also love, uh, we also love when aeroplanes crash. Beautiful things, Airbus, boats, and then they crash, fantastic. Off the scale popular with news websites. What is going on? Are we again sick? No, we're not. We're searching for the meaning of life.
The thought of death, a higher, a heightened awareness of death, is one of the tools which helps to bring the meaning of life into focus. We used to know this as a civilization. In the Middle Ages, when you were decorating uh, your bedchamber or your office, a standard piece of decoration was a memento mori, a skull, either a literal physical skull or a painting of a skull. And this was designed to focus your mind on the omnipresence of death, not in order to sink you into despair, but in order to remind you of what matters. I think we're vainly searching for an element of that when we come up against the sudden awareness of uh, uh, the loss of others in tragic accidents. But again, the news is not helping us. It's not tying up the loose ends. Um, and that's why it's, we're both compelled, because there is something important, and yet unresolved and slightly with a low-level anxiety, because there's been no catharsis. Okay, the other thing that the news constantly does to us is make us scared of everything, of bird flu and swine flu and cockroaches and um, strange UFOs and Martians and anything, you name it, we're constantly being terrified. Um, and, you know, it's very surprising, but we live with so much terror, news-induced terror, that it's sometimes amazing when people, you know, people's car breaks down on a, on a country lane and, um, uh, you know, it's time to go and talk to a stranger. Very difficult moment when you're reading the news uh, because you know that everyone is going to be an axe murderer, a pervert, or a weirdo, or a paedophile. So what do you do? Um, well, you have to go and talk, and then nine times out of ten, in fact, 9.99999 times out of ten, um, it's absolutely fine. Indeed, they're really nice because most people are really, really nice. We wouldn't have murders on the front page if people murdered all the time. It's deeply anomalous. We forget this very basic point. Um, uh, the, news, you know, the news headlines is a, 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 a such a distorted picture of our society. We're constantly losing a sense of how things really are. And we, we, start, we, we constantly take the anomalous to be the normal instead of seeing that, of course, it's only on the front page because it is so deeply unusual. The first lesson of looking at all news sources. Remember that it is not the norm. That's why it's there. Um, so the news swings us into terrible fears, and then occasionally it swings us into hope, particularly regarding politicians. Maybe this politician can fix it. The last one was useless, but this one can fix it. And then also health news. Health news is a repository of a kind of utopian ideal that perhaps we can crack death. So lots of thoughts about you know, what will cure Alzheimer's. Maybe extra walnuts at night, or some special long socks that you'll worn wear on long flights. I mean, what's going to cure kidney disease, maybe it's, you know, some flowers or whatever it is. It's endless suggestions of the kinds of things that may help us. What the news doesn't do is to accept the baseline truth, which is we're all going to die. And um, rather than accepting this sober fact with dignity like these guys used to do, um, uh, it, it gives us a kind of hope that perhaps we can crack it. And it gives us a feeling that, you know, guys in white coats are, are currently just now at, you know, MIT or in Stanford trying to solve the thing. And if we just get the new kind of fruit juice, we'll be solved, etc. It does doesn't do us the greatest favor, which is to induct us gently and with dignity into the base facts of our lives. It swings us from extremes of hope to despair and leaves us anxious. Now, the other thing that we need to really get a grip on is this phenomenon, celebrity. Now, serious people are appalled by the fact that we're all gripped by celebrity. And they point out that celebrities are absolutely vulgar and gross and uh, disgusting. And they shun the whole thing. Now, I think it's very important for a society to have celebrities. We can't do without celebrities. We need role models. The idea of a role model is fundamental. All good societies have had role models. You can't do without them. The problem is, let's not abandon the making of role models to the lowest common denominator. But at the moment, the serious news doesn't care about anointing uh, celebrities. So it abandons this task to the lowest common, denom common denominator, and that's where we get this very nice young lady. There are sometimes glimpses of how, other, of how things might be. Recently, Natalie Portman took her two-year-old child to the park. Now, going to the park with a small child is very boring, as you all know. Um, <laughs> however, it's also really, really important. Um, it's really, really important because their development, your development, etc. It's very important. It's very useful when a big star, who could be doing all sorts of things, decides that actually she's going to take her son to the park. Suddenly, it shines the light of glamour, and we need glamour to encourage us to do things that, you know, not that pleasant to do. We need a little bit of help. And there is St. Natalie helping us. St. <laughs> Natalie, the saint of going for a walk uh, uh, in the park. Now, we used to be surrounded by saints. Society used to be surrounded by saints um, who, you know, a saint for this and a saint for that, and they would nudge us in the right direction. A well-functioning society, I think, is one that has useful role models. This model has really broken down, partly because elites refuse to accept the seriousness of the job of role modeling. Um, look, there's something else about the news, and it happens on the weekend, um, mostly on the weekend. There's this sort of idea that reading the news, the newspapers, 
in particular, is a normal thing to do on the weekend. So, you know, it's a sunny Sunday morning, the birds are chirping, and you'll go and read the Sunday newspaper. There's something very dangerous that is likely to happen when you do so. Um, there's sometimes, uh, uh, you know, warnings of strobe lighting when they're showing you images, you know, warning strobe lighting. What they should really be over the Sunday papers is a warning, envy, envy. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, Sunday newspapers are the moment of most concentrated uh, a dose of envy that we're likely to receive from the news, although throughout the week it will be doing a jolly good job of uh, dosing us up. Um, the reason is that we live in uh, very mobile societies where the possibility of attaining amazing things is unfortunately a little bit too close to be put completely out of mind. We know that it's possible. Um, for example, this is a man called Elon Musk. He's 46 years old, two years older than me. It used to be great. When you're a bit younger, you can always go, well, if someone's 46, okay, well, that's, you know, maybe I've got another 12 years. So I could, you know, this guy founded eBay and PayPal, and he's putting men on Mars, and he's developed an electric car company, and, and he, this is his wife, and he's got five children, and he's just, and he's worth at 12 billion dollars, um, and um, we're supposed to be happy about this. We're supposed to be really pleased. <laughs> we're, supposed, we're supposed to be able to read this sort of stuff and then go, darling, shall we have lunch? And just not <laughs> suffer any kind of damaging effect. It's nonsense. This is deeply worrying. Now, part of our neo-Christian heritage is we're embarrassed about envy. We shouldn't be embarrassed about envy. We should put it to use. Envy is very useful. Um, inside every envious attack, there is a clue, however foggy it might be, about something that we should be trying to achieve or attain. Um, but what we need to do is to sit down and analyze, quite soberly and with sensitivity, what is making us envious. We should probably keep a diary of envy. You should probably write down the names of everyone who makes you envious. Because you'll start to see, if you study those names, you'll start to see patterns emerging. And those patterns are uh, code about where you should be heading in, in your life. For example, if I look at this man more closely, so I've got to, you know, if I try and move on from a general envious attack towards a more sincere focus, okay, what does this man really teach me about what I want? I don't actually want to start an electric car company. I've got no interest in putting men on Mars, etc. cetera. Um, uh, my wife's very nice. We don't, don't need this lady. Um, so what is, it, what is it really that's, that's kind of getting me uh, about this man? I think what I'm envious of is his courage. Uh, his determination, his ability to persuade a lot of people of some quite unlikely sounding things and carry them with him. So all of these things are really important. The news, and particularly in that staple of Sunday newspaper, the interview is hopeless about this. It circles people's achievements without really trying to pin down what might be important. It doesn't help us with our envy because it isn't alive to it. So again, you're starting to get a sense of the themes that I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking. The news is often presenting us with important and interesting material and then leaving us to work out what we might do with it. That's why my book is called A User's Manual. How can we make use of this stuff, some of which is very important? How can we make it go better in our own lives? Now, look, there's something else about the news, um, and that is the idea that the more serious the news outlet you go to, the less the news that they should be providing you with um, should be biased. In other words, the worst kind of news is really biased news, and the best kind of news is unbiased news. So... <coughs> The worst kind of news is, you know, Fox News or the Daily Mail or something. You know, it's very biased news, and, um, uh, and that's terrible. But you know, you go up, up the scale, and of course, you know, in this country, um, uh, right at the top of the, the, the pile is the BBC, and um, this must be very good because they just present you with the information, the facts, and um, they're not trying to influence you or get inside your mind or tell you what to think or anything like that. They're very, very balanced reporting. So they'll do a feature on, you know, genital mutilation. So someone is for genital mutilation, and someone is against genital mutilation. Uh, Someone is you know, for genocide, and someone is against genocide. <laughs> and they'll just be very, very even. It's nonsense. Of course you need bias. The thing is, you need the right sort of bias. You don't need crazy bias. But what we desperately need is some guidance. What are we to make of the flurry of facts that comes at us every day? We need guidance. But the news is prey at odd moments to a kind of sense of restraint that if it were to tell us what to think, we might not be able to say no. We'd be sort of convinced by the BBC. The BBC told me the other day that the only moment when they abandoned impartiality after much heartache and much thinking is they decided to admit that they thought uh, that apartheid was a bad thing. Uh, ever since then, they have not come down on any issue with any uh, uh, degree of bias. They should get a lot more bias. We need bias, particularly when it comes to something like economics. You know, economic news is, in a sense, the most important news. And yet the way that the economics is reported um, in serious outlets is so often 
um, devoid of the kind of muscle that will enable us to make sense of the world that we live in and give us a sense of the options, the real options that we're facing. So there'll be you know, very small uh, you know, issues around uh, uh, you know, interest rates or currency movements, etc. Of course, these are, have their place and are important. But the wider picture, which is who's getting what and why? How are we doing this? Where, what are the options for change? It's so uh, unbelievable how even at the height of the financial crisis, um, this kind of data was kept out of the public mind. People at this point might say, oh, are you a Marxist? And you want to go, no, there's a real difference between, you know, there's a, there's a real spectrum between a Marxist on the one hand and people who support the status quo absolutely on the other. There's a lot of good ideas out there about how we might make our world slightly better, slightly nicer, uh, and yet you wouldn't necessarily know it from following the economic news agenda. And this leads to, on the one hand, you know, bottled up rage and low level depression, and then occasionally explosions of rage, but very inarticulate ones. This is the Occupy uh, movement. People who care very deeply know that things are wrong, but have been watching the wrong kind of news because they have no good ideas about what to change. So a desperate naivety and sentimentality allied with real energy to change. It's a recipe for disaster. So after a while, these guys get hosed down by the police and are moved on, and the world doesn't change. The news is partly responsible for creating a world that marries up uh, this kind of genuine passion with ignorance and defangs the ability for change. Very bad. Part of the problem is that the news is obsessed by bad guys, and it hates systemic problems. Many of the problems facing our civilization are not the work of anyone that you could tidily put in handcuffs and take away. Right? It's the work of people who are not necessarily evil, but misguided, not necessarily you know, looking to corrupt and control, but they've you know, lacking imagination. Take the housing crisis that's afflicting the southeast of England. Um, it's not the work of one person that you could tidily put in prison, um, and yet it's one of the, most, the biggest problems. It's a messy story that journalists don't quite like, because if you open up the hearts of most journalists, on their heart is written Watergate. They're looking for the Watergate paradigm, paradigm everywhere. One person or few people, a cabal, in a room somewhere doing very bad things. Journalist comes along, gets a little bit of information. The world changes. Right? Most problems are much subtler, much more elusive than that. And yet the news doesn't filter. It can't see them through the filter. Um, look, the other thing that the news doesn't tell us, and it's a very basic point, uh, is that the most important things that have happened in the history of humanity have not necessarily happened in the previous half hour. We are a species with a long history, and there's a lot of stuff that we have forgotten, and that therefore, if it came to the fore right now, would be news. You know, if the contents of Plato's Republic became properly known, it would be headline news. You know, democracy not always good, says big thinker. You know, amazing. You know, that could be really big thinker. Or you know, if the truths of the Buddha were told more explicitly, um, this would be you know, headline news. Um, so the news is supposed to be the most important thing in our society. Right? We, that's why we accord it this almost religious reverence. That's why there's this sonorous music before a bulletin. That's why we listen like children at school assembly for the important stuff. Um, we've got to make sure that it really is the important stuff, which may mean, sometimes, it may absolutely mean what happened in the last half hour. And sometimes we may need to stretch our optics 3,000 years. So we need news organizations that are willing to accept this. And then sometimes we, as the consumers of news, need to realize that there are moments when we've had enough news. And we need to go somewhere where we're left alone with, as it were, our own agenda. The news is the most wonderful tool of distraction uh, ever invented. And the great thing about it is that it sounds so serious. You know, what are you doing, darling? I I'm just looking at the news. Oh, yes, the news. So important, right? <laughs> if you said, you know, what are you doing, darling? I'm just staring out the window and sort of thinking about a moment in my childhood. Get up, do the washing up. Um, <laughs> That's not serious, right? So we need to accept that being with ourselves, um, taking the news from ourselves is a very important uh, part of what it means to be a good citizen uh, and a good person. Uh, aeroplanes are some of the few places left nowadays until they put Wi-Fi everywhere. It can be a sad day. But for the moment, we can still find room moments for reflection on a, a, a long flight. And the thing about you know, room for reflection is we start to notice all sorts of things. We're not alone on the planet. There are other things on the planet. And they've got really different agenda. And this guy doesn't care about all sorts of things that you think are really important. He doesn't know that it's the Sochi Olympics. Uh, he doesn't know about you know, Nick Clegg and, and David Cameron and, and Scottish nationalism. And it's 
it's just important to remind us uh, of uh, the existence of these very uh, uh, small creatures. Uh, talking of small creatures, there are two small creatures in this room that I'd like to give a special thanks to. They're my children, who, uh, they're not the size of this bird by any means, they're seven and nine, they're dear creatures, and they daily remind me that there are priorities which have nothing to do with the news agenda, and I'm very grateful for them for coming here for listening today. I know that it's um, a, a bit of a bore for them, but they are a, a <laughs> reminder, they're a reminder um, of a very important balancing act, psychological balancing act, which we're finding it ever harder to do. Look, by training, I'm a philosopher. And philosophers think that they know it all and that they've got very important truths in hand. Um, the problem is no one's really listening. The average work of philosophy, um, a friend of mine told me uh, uh, the other day, the ac average academic work of philosophy uh, is read by 300 people, right? That's 300 people. Um, and yet this is supposed to be a really important truth. Um, the Daily Mail website has 40 million hits a day. 40, you've, got, you've, got th you, you know, you've got 300 and 40 million, right? That is the world that we're dealing with. What is one supposed to do? Um, so one, uh, the obvious option is to despair, get very, very sad. Um, but um, I and the School of Life, we don't believe in despair. We're very, very optimistic people. So uh, the other day, the School of Life and I, we came up with a new project. Uh, it's funded by the school. And what we've done is to rewrite the Mail Online. Uh, and every day, um, we look at all the stories that the Mail looks at, you know, the murders, the suicides, the incest, the celebrity stories, etc. And we caption them differently, though. We caption them with a view to philosophical uh, justice, compassion, kindness, gentleness, etc. So, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to The Philosopher's Mail, um, uh, which you can look at uh, at uh, the website, uh, philosophersmail.com. And uh, you, you can go look at uh, We've had a great start. Please come and visit us. Uh, it's a, the sort of project that we love doing at, at the School of Life. Um, so, um, we're going to end it there. Thank you very much.